Hi, this is Dr. Anthony Revis with SVSU General Chemistry 111, Chapter 3, Lecture 1. That's Lecture 1 of Chapter 3, Compositions of Substances and Solutions. In this chapter, we will cover formula mass, molecular weight, and the mole concept. We'll also discuss determinant empirical and molecular formula. We will also take a look at combustion analysis as well as molarity. These topics will be covered but not necessarily in that order. As we examine this chapter it's important to take a look at some concepts and definitions that will be very helpful as we move forward. Without these definitions some things would get a bit confusing in part due to the fact that many of the terms sound alike and there are some interchangeable terms that you want to be aware of. So, as you start to look at this chapter, you want to start to pay attention closely to the units. The units will be a key indicator of how the term is being used and how to use it in working problems. And speaking of working problems, this chapter will deal with working problems as a method of teaching. So, the teaching in this chapter will focus primarily on using examples to teach the concepts rather than just sticking with the formal definition. Okay? With that, let's take a look at some definitions. First, chemical formula. Chemical formula expresses the ratio of atoms or moles or molecules within a chemical substance. For example, glucose. Glucose has a chemical formula of C6H12O6. That is exactly what glucose is. It is C6H12O6. That is what a chemical formula expresses. Six atoms, six moles, six molecules of carbon. 12 atoms, 12 molecules, 12 moles of hydrogen, 6 atoms, 6 molecules, 6 moles of oxygen. That's what the chemical formula expresses. Atomic mass is the sum of the atomic masses in AMU in a molecule. For example, glucose, C6H12O6, has an AMU value of 180.156. Molecular mass or molecular weight or molar mass is the sum of the atomic masses in grams in one mole of a molecule. The key term here is molar. It most often refers to the grams in one mole of the substance. So for example, glucose has a molecular mass or a molar mass of 180.156 gram per mole. If we just said the molecular mass, we would say 180.156 grams. But when we talk about molar mass, we tend to refer to it as 180.156 gram per mole. It sounds a bit like semantics and it might be, but it's important to differentiate these because how they are used is important to how you carry out certain calculations. Again, paying attention to the units will help in that regard. More definitions and concepts. Molecular formula expresses the ratio of atoms or moles or molecules for the exact chemical substance. For example, Glucose is exactly C6H12O6. That is its molecular formula. Glucose is not C1H6O1. Keep in mind, in chemistry we do not write the ones. So CH6O is not the molecular formula for glucose. Glucose is exactly six atoms of carbon 12 atoms of hydrogen and 6 atoms of oxygen. That is its molecular formula. That is the formula for that molecule, for a molecule of glucose. 
The empirical formula, on the other hand, is the lowest whole number ratio of atoms in a chemical formula that represents the structure or represents the substance. For example, glucose empirical formula is CH6O. That empirical formula is derived from its molecular formula of C6H12O6 by dividing by the common denominator of 6 to give you C1H6O. Again, keep in mind, we do not write the ones in chemistry. Formula mass of a substance is the sum of the average atomic masses of all the atoms in the formula of the substance. For example, the formula mass for C6H12O6, which is glucose, is 180.156 AMU. The molecular mass for glucose is 180.156 gram per mole, which we also refer to as its molar mass. The empirical formula is C6H6, which has empirical molar mass of 30.026 gram per mole. These are subtle differentiations that you will want to watch for as you work your way through this chapter. By the way, the formula mass of a covalent substance, and it's very important to understand what a covalent substance is, may be correctly referred to as the molar mass. In other words, covalent substances come from the non-metals area of the periodic table, which we discuss in Chapter 2. So if you know it is a covalent substance, then the formula mass may be properly referred to as the molar mass. That is, again, a subtle distinction that you want to keep in mind. As we work our way through this chapter, we'll come back to these concepts and these definitions to hopefully help it to sink in and make more sense to you. The common link for these concepts and definitions is the periodic table. The periodic table contains the atoms, elements, molecules of the substances that are used in chemistry. It contains the elements known to man. So let's start to learn these concepts by practicing and working problems to illustrate how they're used in chemistry. Ready? Let's start with the chemical formulas. The subscripts in a chemical formula express the ratio of atoms or moles. In other words, when you look at the chemical formula, you are actually looking at the ratio of one atom to the other. For example, in aspirin, aspirin is C9H8O4. That is one molecule, one atom, one mole of aspirin. It is composed of nine carbon atoms, eight hydrogen atoms, and four oxygen atoms. You might also express that by saying it is nine molecules of carbon, eight molecules of hydrogen, and four molecules of oxygen. You might also refer to it as nine, being composed of nine moles of carbon, eight moles of hydrogen, and four moles of of oxygen. So the subscripts again in a chemical formula express the ratio of the atoms or moles to each other. Similarly with sodium chloride. One molecule of sodium chloride has one atom of sodium or one mole of sodium and one atom of chlorine or one mole or one molecule of chlorine. Now, it might also be referred to as molecules, but you're going to learn later in this same chapter that formally when we refer to molecules, we must use a factor called Avogadro's number. But for general conversations about chemical structures and formulas, the term molecules is often used interchangeably with moles and atoms 
although in many instances it is not a precise description of molecules. So you want to keep that in mind. But in the common language of science and chemists, it is often used interchangeably. So take a look at potash algum. With potash algum, it's one molecule of uh, KAL, parentheses, SO4, parentheses, 2. We have one potassium, one aluminum, two sulfurs, and eight oxygens. Two sulfurs because the two outside the bracket is multiplied through everything within the bracket. Eight Oxygen because the two outside the bracket is multiplied again with everything within the bracket to give you two times four gives you eight. Two times one sulfur gives you two. Since the potassium and aluminum are outside the bracket and there are no uh, subscripts, there's only one of each of those atoms. Also note that atoms equals molecules equals particles, but not exactly moles. And that's very important to keep in mind. Even though, again, you will hear many of these terms interchange, atoms can always be exchanged for molecules. Molecules can always be exchanged for particles, but not always exchanged for moles. It sounds a bit confusing, but it will make sense as you work through this chapter. What are we trying to do? We're trying to introduce you to the concepts and to the definitions and also to the language of how chemists tend to talk about it so that you'll know how to differentiate the specifics of each of these terms that are often used interchangeably. So let me see if I can say this more clearly. Although atoms and moles are not exactly the same, their ratios within a chemical formula are the same. Atoms will always equal the same number of molecules, will always equal the same number of particles, but they will not always equal the same number of moles, although the ratio of the atoms and moles within a chemical formula will always be exactly the same. You'll learn more about that as we start to talk about Avogadro's number. So keep that in mind. When we talk about atoms and moles being used in chemical formulas, we can talk about them because their ratios are exactly the same. That is an important principle to remember. So since their ratios within a chemical formula are the same, that is, the ratio of atoms to atoms and mole to mole are exactly the same within a chemical formula, we can interchange them when we are working with chemical formulas and solving problems related to chemical formulas as a conversion factor. So, compounds and substances have a specific chemical formula. They also have a molar mass that's related to that chemical formula. Molecular mass or molar mass, or molecular weight, as it's often referred to, is the sum of the atomic masses in grams in one mole of a molecule or compound. It is based on the chemical formula, which is, in fact, its molecular formula. It describes that species, that substance, that composition of matter, exactly. Let's take an example of sulfur dioxide, SO2, which has the structure shown here. Sulfur dioxide is composed of one mole, one atom of sulfur, two moles, two atoms of oxygen to give you one molecule, one mole of sulfur dioxide. The AMU values are shown here for each of these elements. These are taken from the periodic table. And we have two oxygens, so we must multiply two times the 16 AMU from the periodic table. When we sum these, we get the 
atomic mass of 64.07. Those values are exactly the same as what you would report for the molar mass. But in that case, the units are 64.07 gram per mole. So there are 60, approximately 67 grams in one mole of this substance. Okay? And that value is the same as the AMU. Keep that in mind. So essentially, if you know the AMU of a substance, of a molecule, of an atom, you know the gram per mole of that. They can be used interchangeably. So for any molecule, the molar mass equals the molecular mass or the molar mass. Okay? Let me say that again. For any molecule, the molecular mass, the AMU, equals the molar mass in grams. And we show you that comparison here for sulfur dioxide. One molecule of sulfur dioxide has an AMU of, of six, approximately 64.07, and it has one mole of sulfur dioxide equals 64.07 grams of sulfur dioxide. So this is how we would calculate the molar mass. We would take each of the elements in the chemical formula. We would look on the periodic table. We would multiply it through based on the number of each of these. And we would do the arithmetic and you have it. Calculating the molar mass is no more complicated than that. Simply look on the periodic table. Write down the molar mass for each of the species. Multiply it or add them several times over for the atom count. Once you sum it. That is your complete AMU or gram per mole. Let's take a look at some other examples of molar mass for calculating gram per mole. Most of the work done moving forward in this chapter and some of the chapters after will involve gram per mole more than AMU. So, to calculate the molar mass, we look at the elements, and we use the values from the periodic table. And we do straightforward arithmetic or straightforward math. To do this multiplication math, we assume that you can multiply. Now, one of the things we should point out that perhaps we did not make clear is that when we read chemical formulas, we read chemical formulas from bottom right back up left. So we read the subscript on the right side of the bottom and it's related to the element to its left. If there are parentheses involved then we multiply through the math. We will assume that again you can do the multiplication math. So take a look at uh, lithium carbonate. We have lithium carbonate here and it it is composed of two lithiums, so we multiply it times the 6.94 for the periodic table. We have one carbon at 12, three oxygen, 16 each. We do the math multiplication, and then we sum for a total of the gram per mole of 73.89. It is that straightforward. The magnesium nitrate, we have one magnesium. And note that we have a 2 outside the nitrate, so everything inside the parentheses gets multiplied. So it's 2 nitrogens and 6 oxygens. We do the multiplication math, and we get a, total, a grand total of 148.3 gram per mole. We show you the math for doing this one at the bottom of this slide. And it's nitrogen, 1 times the 2, and 3 times the 2 oxygen atoms and there you have it for your molar mass. Potassium chloride is only one mole, one atom of potassium, one mole of chlorine, one atom of chlorine for one molecule, one mole of potassium chloride with the given molar mass. In carrying out calculations involving chemical reactions, molar mass is used as a conversion factor. A conversion factor in chemistry uses the dimensional analysis process to convert one unit to another, which means you're converting the form of one substance to another substance. So, 
The molar mass is a useful conversion factor. It converts moles of a substance to grams and it converts grams of a substance to moles. There is no direct gram over gram conversion factor to make. However, if you want to convert grams of one substance to grams of another, you must first go through the moles of that substance. So if we have one mole of magnesium, that equals 24.31 grams of magnesium. Magnesium is on the periodic table. If you look on the periodic table, you'll see 24.31. That's 24.31 gram per mole or AMU. We are now discussing molar mass. Therefore, it is gram per mole. So what you have is 24.31 grams magnesium over one mole of magnesium. Or you can invert that as you know it's possible when you're doing math you can invert. So it's one mole of magnesium over 24.31 gram of magnesium. The operations of math are what you want to consider when you think of conversion fact. If it's not mathematically sound it is not going to be sound in chemistry. Do not violate the rules of math in carrying out the operations and you'll be more successful. In other words, chemists have not invented new mathematical processes. It's just that chemists have a process by which they use the math to consistently get to answers that scientists can use around the world. Let's take a look at another example. The subscripts in the chemical formula of aspirin, C9H8O4, express the ratio of atoms or moles, which has a molar mass of 180.157 gram per mole. That is the molar mass of aspirin. So if we look at the molar ratio of aspirin, we see that we have 180 grams per every one mole, which is the same as one mole per 180.157 gram. Those are the molar mass conversion factors that we might use in math involving aspirin. We can take a look at the atom molecules or mole count conversion factors as well. We have one molecule of aspirin, nine carbons, eight hydrogens, four oxygens. We could say then one mole of this because the ratios of moles and atoms are exactly the same, although atoms and moles are not the same. Their ratios in a chemical formula are the same. And so since that is the case, one mole of aspirin has nine moles of carbon, eight moles of hydrogen, and four moles of oxygen. Again, keep in mind, atoms do not equal moles, but the molar ratio within a chemical formula are exactly the same. We can take a look at the molar ratio conversion factors, and we say that we have nine moles of carbon per every one mole of aspirin. We have eight moles of hydrogen per one mole of aspirin, four moles of oxygen per one mole of aspirin. We could also invert those to use as conversion factors. Now, many of you are going to be tempted, and some of the textbooks will say, once you get to this point in your math, write out all the conversion factors. I suggest that that can be a lengthy process. What will help you determine which conversion factors you need to write out will be the givens in the problem. And we'll show you how to get through that without having to write out every conversion factor. So, Let's make a note now that in my lectures, I am not interested in you writing out every possible conversion factor. I'm only interested in you writing out the conversion factors that matter for the problem at hand. So please bear that in mind. All right. So with that, let's start to work some problems. Again, recall, this chapter will be taught by working problems. We have a box of salt, table salt, contains 737 grams of sodium chloride. How many moles of sodium chloride are present in the box? The very first step in any of these problems is not for me to write out all the conversion factors. 
because there are too many possible ones. Write the given. The given is 737 grams. Therefore, my first conversion factor must be grams to something. So I set up a dimensional analysis as we've taught in chapter 2. And I set up a crossbar. And on the bottom, I immediately write grams of sodium chloride. And since I know that grams can be related to moles, which is what I'm looking for, I will put moles over grams. Keep in mind, gram per mole or mole per gram can be used, but gram to gram cannot be used. Mole to mole can be used. Molecule to mole can be used, but never use gram per gram. So if I set up this dimensional analysis based upon sound mathematical principles and following the units, the units must cancel out, or be retained, depending on where you are in the problem. If we set this up properly, then we get an answer of 12.6 moles of sodium chloride. It's 12.6 because there are three sig figs in the original given, and therefore my answer must have three sig figs. I've also shown you where you get the molar mass from. In working problems in my lectures, the expectation is that you will show every step, including how you got the molar mass. Okay, So particularly early on in this process, the expectation is that you will show where you got the molar mass. So I would expect in a problem in my lectures to see how the molar mass was calculated. So in this case, we show it to you here. And since we've calculated, we can use it as a conversion factor to solve our problem of grams to moles. Let's work another problem. If the design of a piece of jewelry requires 0.750 moles of silver, how many grams of silver are needed? So we have 0.75 moles of silver, and we want to go to grams of silver. Okay? So in order to do that, which conversion factor do we use? The moles in the given tells us that we need the first conversion factor to contain moles on the bottom. So if we put one mole on the bottom, we know then to get to grams, the, the relationship between gram per mole or mole per gram is permitted. Therefore, we calculate uh, the molar mass, or excuse me, in this case, it's only silver, so there's no calculation. We simply look on the periodic table, and we get 107.9 grams of silver, we do the calculations to three sig figs because there are three sig figs in the starting given, and therefore we get 80.9 grams of silver. So that's how we would convert moles to grams. So what do we do if we want to convert grams of a compound to grams? The key link will always be an interconversion involving a molar ratio. You will learn later in chapters to come how to do this for chemical reactions. Here's the problem. How many grams of chlorine are in 10.2 grams of calcium chloride? We start with a given. The given is in gram, therefore my crossbar has to involve grams on the bottom it is, makes sense and is logical to take grams to moles because that's the only conversion we can make for grams in these. It will, if you put grams in the equation, it's going to go gram per mole. Now we have moles on the top and we must now crossbar one mole on the bottom because that's what's mathematically sound in a dimensional analysis. And so here's where we make the inner conversion. We inner convert mole of calcium chloride to moles of carbon. And the question you ask is, how many moles of chlorine are in calcium chloride? The answer is two. So two moles for every one mole of calcium chloride. And we carry out the remainder of the dimensional analysis by saying crossbar moles on the bottom, because that's the mathematical way of canceling out. And on top, we have chlorine. And when we run the calculations, we round to 6.52, because it must have three sig figs in the answer. Please note that having three sig figs in 
both these answers and in several of the examples is not a requirement. It just happens that they were three sig figs. There's nothing magic about three sig figs in chemistry. So if we take a look at this then, we had calcium chloride and we it contains two moles of chlorine and one mole of calcium. Therefore, we can establish a molar ratio of two moles chlorine over one mole of calcium chloride. Okay. We also, just so we are aware, we have one mole of calcium for every one mole of calcium chloride. So we use this formula ratios as conversion factors in converting grams to grams. Anytime a problem involves going grams to grams, there will be an interconversion factor of mole to mole. Mole to mole is used as an interconversion factor for going from one species to the other. Okay? When you want to change from one species to the other, you must go through a factor that says moles of A over moles of B or moles of B over moles of A. Okay? We pointed out to you earlier that molecules, atoms, and particles may be directly exchanged and will have the same values. Moles may be used in a similar fashion as atoms because in a chemical formula they have the same ratio. However, moles of a species will not be the same value as the exact number of molecules. So how do we address this? We address the difference in the values between molecules and moles through Avogadro's number. Avogadro's number is a conversion factor that's used to convert moles to molecules or moles to particles or moles to atoms. Okay? So, here's how the Avogadro principle works. Avogadro's principle is that one mole of any substance is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms or molecules or particles or other such units of that substance. So again, Avogadro's number allows us to relate atoms, molecules, or particles to the mole. So what's a mole? A mole is a unit that references the same number of particles as there are carbon atoms in 12 grams. That is one mole of carbon. In other words, Avogadro's number has carbon 12 as its standard. This was discussed previously in chapter 2. So how do we look at it in a practical sense? Here's what we know then. One mole of any element contains 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms or molecules or particles of that element. And we show you that in this table. One mole of carbon has Avogadro's number of atoms. One mole of gold has Avogadro's number of atoms. One mole of carbon has Avogadro's number of molecules. One mole of gold has Avogadro's number of molecules. One mole of carbon has Avogadro's number of particles. One mole of gold has Avogadro's number of particles. One mole of any species will have Avogadro's number of particles, atoms, or molecules and therefore it can be used as a conversion factor for converting moles into molecules or molecules into moles or atoms into moles or moles into atoms or particles into moles or moles into particles. So let's look at that. Avogadro's number converts moles of a substance to the number of atoms or molecules. Okay, that's what it's used for. When grams are involved, you must convert to moles before converting to atoms or molecules. That is so important. In most Gen Chem courses, you will have to convert, convert moles to atoms and moles to molecules, and you will have to use Avogadro's number. So in a problem involving molecules and atoms, be assured that you will be using Avogadro's number. So let's say if we had four moles of iron, we would convert that four moles 
using Avogadro's number by drawing our cross hash, one mole on the bottom, because that's a mathematical sign way to do a dimensional analysis. And on top, we have the atoms of iron on top, and we do the calculations, and we get a value with three sig figs. In counting sig figs, recall, we do not use the times 10 to the whatever value that is. So times 10 to the 24 does not figure into our significant figures. So Avogadro's number is a convergent factor that you can use. In fact, in carrying out dimensional analysis, any equivalent values may be used as conversion factors. So here we just show you a diagram here for some. They enjoy using diagrams like this. You can write out your own uh, diagram if you, if you wish. But basically at the end of the day, we must go through moles to get from mass to atoms or molecules using Avogadro's number. So the way we get from mass to atoms is through Avogadro's, which needs moles to operate. By the way, it's interesting to note that a teaspoon of table salt contains one million quartillion molecules. So you see then why the mass of is far different than the number of molecules. Six uh, grams is a, is a teaspoon. So there's about six grams in a teaspoon. And that's about 0.1 mole of sodium. So you can see that you have 0.1 mole, but you have this one million quartillion molecules. So this is, helps you to understand that moles do not have the same numeric value as molecules even though within a chemical formula it has the same ratio. So let's use Avogadro's number to carry out a calculation. What is the mass in grams of one C60 molecule? Now because one C60 molecule contains 60 atoms and one mole of carbon contains 6.2 022 times 10 to the 23 carbon atoms and has a mass of 12.001 gram, we could carry out the calculations. Now, here's what I really want to impress upon you. When you're preparing to carry out these calculations, don't start by trying to figure out absolutely everything you need to get the job done. Step one is to write the given. The given will dictate the very first conversion factor because the very first conversion factor must match the units of the given in the bottom. So the first step would be to write the given, which is one C60 molecule. Then crossbar, six on the bottom, you would write the molecules, since the molecules are in the given. We would then say molecules to atoms, since we know that these are synonymous. One molecule equals one atom. Then we have atoms on the top of the conversion factor, which tells us to crossbar the atoms on the bottom because that is the mathematical sound way to do it. We know that we can take atoms of carbon to moles of carbon because we one mole of any species equals Avogadro's number of atoms. So therefore, we'll have the one mole. Then the one mole is crossbar on the bottom to moles on the bottom because that's a mathematical sound way to do a dimensional analysis and we now know that we could carry moles to grams of carbon and we get the value shown here 1.197 times 10 to the 21 okay so everyone follow that's how we carry out this particular problem note here that in this case we started with an exact number of one of these. In cases where one, where an exact number is used in these calculations, dealing with sig figs can be somewhat ambiguous. Therefore, in general, when there's an exact number as in a problem like this, where we have exactly one, exactly 60, because these are all, the 60 is a conversion factor, the default position is to the number of sig figs used in your molar mass. 
So keep that in mind, okay? That you want to be aware that when you have exact numbers, the general default position is to the molar mass. Chemical structures can replicate themselves to give higher values of the subscripts. To account for that possibility, we investigate what we call the empirical formula. So what is the empirical formula? The empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio of the atoms in a compound. Again, this is because some substances can exist as multiples of a primary structure. In other words, it's like doing math. It's calculated by dividing the subscripts in the actual or the molecular formula by a whole number to give the lowest ratio. It's like taking the common denominator in math. This is because some chemical formulas exist as multiples of a primary formula. When that is the case, we investigate those by looking at its empirical formula. In the case shown here, C5H10O5 can be divided by 5 to give us C1H2O1. As you recall, we don't write 1s, so the empirical formula is CH2O. This would be the basic formula for C5H10O5. The basic formula is found by using a common denominator to divide out the subscripts in the chemical formula. So, shown here in this table are some examples of them. It's very common to see these, by the way, in organic chemistry. But shown here are some examples where we have the molecular formula of P4H10, but its empirical formula would be P2O5 because it can be reduced by a factor of 2. If we reduce the formula to its empirical formula, we must also reduce the molecular weight or the molar mass. If we have water, we look at water, it cannot be further reduced. It's simply water, 1818. N2O4 can be reduced by a factor of 2, as it happens to be the case for C10H22. Turns out most of these that I've chosen are factors of 2, which is actually very common, particularly in organic chemistry. And note that C5H12O cannot be reduced because 5 and 12 do not have a common factor. So you consider the rules of math when these types of problems are carried out. So let's recap this. The empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio of the atoms in the compound. We calculate it by dividing the subscripts by a common mathematical factor. When we do that, we must also consider its empirical molar mass or its empirical molar mass as well, which might be different from its molecular molar mass. So how do we determine the empirical formula? The following steps will guide you through it. Now, as you work through this, it will become intuitive for some of you to do this, and you won't need the exact steps. So we're going to walk you through the steps, however, so that you can grasp the concept. Once you have the concept, the math will make sense. Step one, convert the element's mass to moles using molar masses. You must use moles in determining empirical formula. You would then divide each number of moles by the smallest number of molar ratios. We'll show you what that means. But we want to impress upon you the use of moles in carrying out these calculations. If necessary, multiply the integer by some value to convert it to a whole number for the subscript. Okay, and That's important. So in other words, if you have a fraction in your molar ratio, mathematically convert that to whole numbers and again that's common math for for many students who take general chemistry so you'll want you'll know how to do that 
If there's a percent composition, convert the mass by assuming 100 grams of the, of the sample. If you make that assumption, your percentage are the same as grams and may be directly substituted in. So if you look at the percentages and the percentages add up to 100, you can right away change the percent sign to gram. That's the key. So the map goes from grams to moles. We must get moles. Then we take moles to molar ratio, and then we take molar ratio to whole numbers. If we have percent composition, we're going to call that percent composition grams because we're going to make the mathematical adjustment to 100%. So let's work a problem. Let's work a problem where we start with grams. A compound is determined to contain 1.71 grams of carbon and 0 0.287 grams of hydrogen. This is a compound and we want to determine its empirical formula. Okay? To do that, step one tells us we must get to moles. To get to moles, we carry out our normal dimensional analysis. Our given is 1.17 gram. We cross bar down to 12.01 gram of carbon because that is the mathematical sound way to do a dimensional analysis. Because we have grams on the bottom, we know that grams can go to moles because that is an acceptable conversion factor in carrying out problems of this type. So we get the moles shown there with three sig figs. We do likewise for hydrogen, grams of hydrogen crossbar down the grams of hydrogen up to moles of carbon and we have a conversion. We then look at these ratios and put one over the other. Okay. Once we put one ratio over the other, we always do the smallest in the denominator. We do that ratio and that ratio comes out to be one to two. Okay. Now, in working through these problems, we must convert these fractions, these decimals, to whole numbers. Step one is to divide by the smallest. If that works out to be approximately a whole number, you take that number. So, for example, if you do the division, it comes out to be something like 0 0.95, that's called one. If you get a number that turns out to be 1.1, that's called 1. If you get a number at 0.5, you double it. If you get a number at 0.75, then you do the other math to convert. You get it? So these numbers are rounded off. Let's look at another example. A compound is determined to contain the, this number of grams, 5.31 grams of chlorine and 8.4 grams of oxygen. We then convert that to moles in the first step, and we show you that we made that conversion. So, having completed the conversion to moles, we then take the ratios over each other, and that ratio comes out to 1 to 3.5. So, at 1 to 3.5, we double this value to find a final empirical formula of Cl2O7. These are the steps, and we follow them through over and over again, the same process, and we'll get to the value. But when you find a number like 1 to 3.5, double it or do whatever math makes mathematical sense to convert it to a whole number. So what happens when we have a percent? With a percent, we must convert that to grams and we do that by assuming 100 grams of the sample. So the bacteria in this fermentation had 27.29 percent carbon, 72.71 percent oxygen. If by simple inspection we look at those numbers and they work out to be 100, we immediately convert those to grams. We call the percents grams because it all works out to be 100. So in this case, the 27.29% is equal to 27.29 grams. We do a crossbar 12 on the bottom, convert to one mole, we have our moles. We do the same process for oxygen. 
We crossbar on the bottom to 16 grams, convert to one mole, and we get our moles of oxygen. We then compare the ratios of these by dividing by the smallest quantity, and we discover that we have carbon dioxide is the empirical formula that we get for this particular experiment. Oftentimes, having the empirical formula is not enough because the molecular formula can be a multiple of the empirical formula. In other words, in a sense, the empirical formula may have replicated itself to a higher value for the subscripts. But we can determine whether that is the case and also discover and find what the molecular formula is by carrying out some relatively straightforward math. Ready? Here's how we do the math. The molecular formula from the empirical formula. How do we get it? A compound's molecular formula can be determined from its empirical formula and its molar or molecular mass. Keep in mind, molecular and molar mass are used interchangeably. So, to do this, we would simply take the molecular or molar mass and divide it by the empirical formula. This will tell us whether or not we have replicas of the empirical formula. And you'll get an N value. Essentially, you want to know whether or not this empirical formula has been doubled, tripled, or some value above it. That's the game. You can actually figure this out in your head for, for most people. You can look at the values, and you can see whether or not it's doubled, tripled, etc. The molecular formula is then obtained by multiplying each subscript by the empirical formula in the empirical formula by N. So, let me repeat that. The molecular formula is then obtained by multiplying each subscript in the empirical formula. So let's show you an example. A compound has an empirical formula of CH2O. This empirical formula has a mass of 30 AMU or 30 gram per mole. We show you here in AMU to emphasize how we can use AMU or gram per mole in carrying out these calculations. And its molar mass is 180 AMU or 180 gram per mole. Again, we can use either of those in carrying out these calculations. But I want to show you this because oftentimes in some problems we will interchange AMU and gram per mole and it tends to disturb students. But AMU is the same as gram per mole in terms of its value. So we take 180 AMU per molecule and 30 AMU per molecule in the formula unit. We discover that it's a multiple of 6. And we take the 6 times its empirical formula and we discover that the molecular formula of this compound is C6H12O6, which is glucose. Okay, so where we have this 180, that could very well simply be gram per mole. Where we have the 30, that could very well simply be gram per mole, which actually is what you see more often in gen chem than you see anything else. So let's work a problem. A sample of a compound contains approximately 30% of nitrogen and almost 70% oxygen by mass. In a separate experiment, the molar mass of the compound is found to be between 90 and 95. This is an experiment that was carried out. In this experiment, we want you to determine the molecular formula and the accurate molar mass of the compound. So essentially, the experiment was run in the lab. This is the data that came out of the lab. They knew the compound was between this molar mass. 90 gram per mole or 95 gram per mole. So, here's where we get to make the assumption of 100 grams. So you assume 100 grams and therefore you can substitute in the percentages for grams. So you basically call the percents grams. That's a very important step because you need grams to get to moles. Percents will not go directly to moles, but grams can be converted moles. 
So once we've made that conversion, let's do the math. Convert the grams of nitrogen to moles of nitrogen by doing a crossbar gram per mole with gram on the bottom because that's a mathematical sound way to do a dimensional analysis. And then we take the 69.5 gram oxygen, 16 on the bottom, per mole of oxygen. When we calculate these through, the top value of nitrogen is 2.174, 4 sig figs divided by itself, and the oxygen 4.346 divided by the nitrogen moles, and this gives an empirical formula of N1O2. We don't write the ones. So the molar mass of the empirical formula then is 46.01 gram. So this is the base unit. This is the lowest form of NO2 that we can have. There's nothing lower than that. But what we know is that the molar mass of this material in the laboratory was somewhere between 90 and 95 grams. So we'll take the 90 grams or the 95 grams and we'll divide it by the empirical formula to see how many replicates of NO2 that we have. So what we start with is a 46 gram per mole NO2 and we discover that it's been multiplied times 2 to give us the molecular formula. And so this tells you this experiment was run pretty good in the laboratory because they discovered it's between 90 gram per mole and 95, and I think 92 qualifies for being in that range. So this is how you would carry those out. Same calculations over and over again, watching the math, watching the dimensional analysis, watching the units. Unit analysis is critical. Including the units in the calculations is a very high expectation. In the lectures that I teach, you only get 10% of your points for the right answer at best. You get 90% of your points for the process. The process includes the units. In some instances, even if the right values are shown and the units are not not there, you'll receive zero points. The unit analysis and the process is critical in carrying out scientific calculations. And we want to start to reiterate that. So we've worked through this with a fair number of examples and some terms that are very close in terms of how they sound. Some we discover can be interchanged and some cannot be interchanged. We've also discovered that some values are exactly the same even though their units are not the same. But there's an important differentiating concept that I want to be sure that I reiterate before this lecture ends. It is the difference in formula mass versus molar mass. So let's compare these just so you're aware. And also be aware that occasionally, even as instructors, we tend to talk about them and they sound the same. But I want to be sure that you have a slide that helps you to understand the difference. And here's the difference. Formula mass has the sum of the masses of atoms present in the empirical formula. The molar mass has a mass of a mole, one mole of the molecule. So you want to differentiate that. Formula mass in a formal sense uses AMU, although you will see it many times used the same by many because it just tends to be common to do that. However, Molar mass has gram per mole. So properly done, formal mass would be AMU. And properly done, molar mass, which is rarely mistaken, will be gram per mole. Formula mass is calculated using the empirical formula. Molar mass is calculated using the molecular formula, which may be one and the same, or it may be a replica, a higher subscript replica of the empirical formula. Formula mass may or may not give the exact mass of a molecule. However, molar mass always gives the exact mass of one mole of the molecule. So be aware of those uh, differentiations. 
And that differentiation tends to be important when it comes to ionic compounds. So here are the things to understand about formal mass when it comes to an ionic compound. And again, this is important for you to be aware of as you continue your career in chemistry. Ionic substances are composed of discrete cations and discrete anions combined in ratios to yield electrically neutral bulk matter. So a salt, an ion compound, is really a bulk matter that has positive and negative charged ions that are held together in place to form that bulk matter, which is different fundamentally from a covalent compound. And we want to start to make that differentiation here, or at least make you aware of that differentiation as you continue your, your career in chemistry. Ionic compounds do not exist as molecules, although you will hear instructors, and myself included, will occasionally say that molecule. And that is using it somewhat generic or broad when you talk about that molecule. But, but ionic compounds do not exactly exist as molecules. Okay, They exist as neutral bulk matter. The formal mass of an ionic compound may not correctly be referred to as a molar mass, although you will hear us use that interchangeably molar mass. But I want to make you aware of that. Yes, we're aware that we that we abuse the, the terminology. But I want you to be aware of what the formal definitions look like and the differentiation. And it will make a difference as you move on to higher level chemistry courses. The average atomic masses of, an, of the ions can be approximated to be the same as the average atomic masses of the neutral atom. And that's very important when it comes to ion compounds and their formula mass. An example of a classical ion compound is sodium chloride, table salt. The formula mass is a sum of the atomic masses in AMU in a formula unit of that bulk mass of this ionic compound. And that means it has, sodium has 22.99 AMU. Although in most of the Gen Chem courses, when you're carrying out these calculations, you will be using gram per mole. Be aware of that. Chlorine, if we talk about it in a formal sense of its formula mass, you record in AMU. Although again, in Gen Chem, when we say calculate the molar mass and molecular weight, we'll say gram per mole, and you'll hear it say it's all the same. It is in terms of its values, but it's not quite the same. So we just want to make you aware of that. One formal unit of sodium chloride is given in AMU. One mole of sodium chloride is in gram. For most practical cases in Gen Chem, gram per mole will be your default position. Okay, But we want to make you aware of those subtle differences between formula mass or molecular mass. And with that, we leave you with a conversion table here to use for those who like to have these road maps that helps you th think about these concepts. So that ends it. That's it for Lecture 1 of Chapter 3, SVSU, Gen Chem 111, Chapter 3, Lecture 1.